We're going to celebrate a couple of guys, and so I'm going to ask them to come up. Pastor Tyler, you're first, so come on up here. You're going to sit, come up here for a little while, then you're going to go back and sit down, and then y'all are going to come back up here, and we're going to have a dance-off. It'll be a little dancing competition between the two of you. Uh, whoever wins the dance-off will get most of the money. So, <laughs> he's stretching. Pastor Tyler has been an incredible youth pastor here at CCF. He joined us in 2018. He's been here four years now. And, and maybe you don't know, so let me remind you, the average stay of a youth pastor is nine months. That's pretty awesome. We have a way of keeping people. People love this place. He's been here for four years. He leads our student ministry. He also helps out with our children. But he wants our students to connect to God in a very real and a very lasting way. When Tyler was a kid growing up, he didn't have much. He, as a matter of fact, he can remember going two weeks in his life where he lived off of popcorn. He didn't get much parental guidance. He was pretty much a heathen, a drug addict, a thug. Is there any other bad words I can say about you? I just keep listing just all of that list that goes with all of that stuff until Jesus changed his life. He was also an MMA fighter. He's fought 106. He's fought about 106 MMA fights. He's a pretty awesome guy, but he loves the Lord with all of his heart and he has compassion for your kids like you wouldn't believe. His heart is enormous. He is one of the biggest hearted people that I've ever met in my life. He completed Master's Commission Houston at Crossroads Assembly of God, and that's where he got his training. He served there at Crossroads for a while before coming here to Christian City Fellowship. And I want to say this this morning, I want to say this today, that the youth is the strongest it has ever been since I've been here in 31 years. And this is the man, this is the guy, this is the guy who leads it. Now, because he's been here for four years, I called him up first. And so now I'm going to call up Josh. Josh, you can come and stand on this side of me. <laughs> Pastor Josh and his wife, Kirsten, they joined us back in March of 2021. So he's been here like a year and a half, going on two years. And uh, him and Kirsten, they've been married for 10 years. They have not one, not two, not three. They have four kids. Noah is nine, Melody is eight, London is four, and Owen is two. How many of you know that's a full-time job? How many of you realize family is the most important thing we do at Christian City Fellowship? One of the greatest reflections of you is your family. We build big people, we build big families here, and so I appreciate and I honor him. He is receiving in December, he's finishing and receiving his bachelor's degree in philosophical and historical theology from Oral Roberts University. So he's about to get a little bit of a break after he graduates. Before coming to Christian City Fellowship, Josh served as a youth pastor for a satellite campus in Tulsa, Oklahoma of America's largest church, which is Life Church. Craig Groeschel is the senior pastor. He was a part of that. He learned a lot while he was there in, in Tulsa. Before that, he was a youth slash worship pastor at a church for five years in Arkansas. Then he went to Tulsa, and now he's come here. And now we have him and we have his family because they're a big part of everything that he does. And so, Kirsten, why don't you stand up so everybody can see you. That's his beautiful wife. Ten years of marriage. Four kids. And I don't think there's a chance for a fifth. Could be wrong. That's just what I'm thinking. And so I've been here 31 years. My wife in October, it makes 31 years for us. And I want you to know that at this current moment, right now, after being here for a year and a half, we have more involvement in our praise and worship than we've ever had numbers wise since I've been here in 31 years. And then I'm going to go on and I'm going to say this, that they are on their way to becoming the strongest praise and worship team in my tenure at Christian City Fellowship. They're well on their way. Josh is a gatherer. He gathers people. People like him. I read a quote today from, or this week from Albert Einstein. He said, nobody understands me 
but everybody likes me. <laughs> everybody likes this guy. Everybody likes this guy. The guy up here that you might not like is sitting in the middle. <laughs> But everybody loves these guys because they're amazing guys and both of these guys are willing. What do, you, what do you mean willing? Well, when we give somebody a job description, we put on there and, you know, stuff. You might have to do some stuff. And both of these guys are willing to do stuff and I appreciate that. They're willing to take a leap. They're willing to try something new. I just appreciate their pioneer spirit. You can always tell who a pioneer is because they got arrows in their back. Because pioneers lead the way, they blaze a trail. And here are two trailblazers here standing with me. There's a trailblazer on the front row sitting in front of me, the founding pastor of Christian City Fellowship, Pastor Clyde Drake. Amen, I know him as Pastor Clyde Drake, but rumor has it that some of you know him as Judge Clyde Drake. Just the rumors going around. But I want you to know he's not only an awesome judge, but first and foremost, he's a pastor. Amen. That kind of reminds me of another guy. We call him God. Sometimes he has to judge you, but he's your father. Amen. And so these guys are becoming father figures. I want to be a spiritual father to you guys, but even more so to these guys. And I thank God for Pastor Clyde who's gone before me. I was 12 years old when he hatched and birthed this church. And now here I am and I've been here 31 years later. And the, probably the greatest honor for me, the greatest honor, is not only having these two guys alongside of me, but having that man on the front row in front of me. And so put your hands together for these guys. They are amazing. Now you guys can run and sit down real quick. I'm going to call you back up, but you can run and sit down for just a little bit. I looked uh, because being a pastor and having so many pastor appreciation days, I never get a chance to talk. I got the microphone. I looked, I looked some statistics up, looked into some things, and of course, uh, many, many magazines, many, many profiles list being a pastor as one of the hardest jobs in America. But I found this and I thought it was kind of funny. It was about the perfect pastor. And so let me read this to you. It says the perfect past pastor preaches exactly 10 minutes. He condemns sin roundly, but he never hurts anyone's feelings. He works from 8 a.m. in the morning till midnight, seven days a week, and he's also a church janitor. The perfect pastor makes $40 a week. He wears good clothes, he drives a good car, he buys good books, and he donates $10 a week to the church. He is 29 years old, that's how old these guys are, and he has 40 years of experience. He never forgets a name. And he spends most of his time praying to God. Above all, he's handsome. He also knows when somebody is sick and needs visitation even without anyone telling him about it. He loves to spend time with his family and the perfect pastor has no problem with you dropping in unexpectedly. He also spends most of his time in preparation to speak God's word. Before and after the services, he never fails to speak to every person present and will also take time to listen to you for 15 minutes after the service and pray for every person for at least 10 minutes after the service, reaching everybody in the same service. The perfect pastor always smiles and tells you what you want to hear. He always goes out to eat after lunch with each and every individual family, spreading his time evenly between all, and he always pays for their meals. The perfect pastor eats nutritiously, he gets his rest, he exercises daily, and he's always there to listen to you, night or day. The perfect pastor has a burning desire to work with teenagers, and he spends most of his time with the elderly. He smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to his church. 
He makes 15 home visits a day and he's always in his office to be handy when you need him. The perfect pastor always has time for the pastor's council meetings, the deacon's meetings, the pastoral meetings, the staff meetings, the budget meetings, all of its committees and marriage counseling and personal counseling and mentoring with time left over. He never misses the meeting of any church organization, is always busy evangelizing the unchurched. He meets with all the other pastors in town because they have so much time on their hands. He also focuses on the vision of the house and he attends all of the town meetings for public relations sake. The perfect fast pastor takes his family on vacations and attends all the latest church and ministers conferences and listens to your favorite TV preachers so that he's completely up to date with each prominent TV preacher and what his message was last week. He spends all day Saturday preparing for a Sunday sermon and he focuses on his family too. He, is, he also doesn't overburden the church finances, so he holds down a full-time secular job as well. The perfect pastor never spends your tithes on children's Baskin Robbins ice cream cones. The perfect pastor is always in the next church over. Man, I appreciate these guys because of their growth and what they're doing. And I'm going to tell you, there's a big load. And the biggest load that's going to fall on you guys is not today. It's in your future. Your best days are in, the, in your future. Forbes magazine rates being a pastor as one of the hardest jobs in America. And last year, by the way, during a critical time, we had several pastors that took their life, which if anybody's going to take their life, I, I can't imagine it being a pastor. The Barna Group, who is the most recognized of all spiritual and church services that do, uh, they do reporting, they do polling, up with data. Barna Group said this, that 38% of pastors are seriously considering quitting the ministry. 46% of the pastors under the age of 45 are seriously considering quitting ministry. Pepperdine University did a poll this last year also involving 900 pastors and they decided, they judged that only one in three pastors are considered healthy. What the pastor said what Pepperdine University said. And 34% of those pastors were over the age of 45 so it doesn't matter whether you're young or you're old. Forbes magazine in one of their articles they said that being a pastor is like death by a thousand paper cuts. They said you're scrutinized and criticized from top to bottom, stem to stern. You work for an invisible, perfect boss, and you're supposed to lead a, lead a ragtag gaggle of volunteers towards God's coming future. It's harder than herding cats. The cost or the price of church leadership is huge. So perhaps it's no surprise that it's been recognized as one of the most difficult tasks of all. The implication of this means that congregations have a responsibility to support those in authority and to cheer them on and to encourage them in their personal walk with God and express gratitude for their service. This is Forbes magazine saying this. They said it's not all bad for pastors though, as Forbes stated. As a pastor, you are seen as a man or a woman of God and what you say gets taken seriously, if only momentarily. These guys give their life. I gave my life. I'm teaching them how to give their life. This man is the founder. He's the father. And, and you know what? We believe that our best days, our biggest days, our most impactful days are ahead of us. Not behind us, but ahead of us. I look forward one day to sitting down here on the same row with, with Pastor Clyde and we'll both be smiling and, and we'll both be celebrating and we'll both be shouting, we'll both be dancing. Why? Because we believe that what God has started, he hasn't finished. And it's not by might or power, and it's certainly not by committee meeting, it's not by more events, it's through the will and the purpose of God that God builds a place strong. And we build big people at Christian City Fellowship. We believe in salvation, healing, and restoration. We're a place for the lost, we're a place for the wounded. There ain't nobody will treat you as good as my Jesus. And so it's an honor to stand alongside of these men. And so we're gonna honor Pastor Josh first. So Pastor Josh, come on back up here. We got a couple people that wanna say a little bit. 
So I'm going to invite Johnny and Maria, Tricka. I want to invite you guys to come on up here. Tricka said the greatest of these was Tricka. Where is Tricka? There she is. Here she comes. Y'all have to notice the way she's dressed. I'm just going to point that out to you. That's not Tricka. It might be Josh. Come on up here, guys. Somebody have a microphone? This one right here will do. Johnny, why don't you start? We're not going to be tricky. We already know this. Uh, it's an honor to honor God's people. I really feel that in this church we have the best pastors. You can drive from here all the way up to Dallas. You ain't going to find better pastors than what we have right here. I, pro I promise you. I promise you. Uh, and it's an honor to just just to be able to say some kind words about these pastors. I can say kind words about them until their heads explode. And, and it's not going to make no difference because they're so firm in who they are. And then them being firm in who they are really gives people that come from out of the world, our secular jobs and everything, that people just want to come in here, team up with these awesome people and just serve. It gives us a good compass. Because it's, it's hard to be in a world, especially this world today, and not be of it. You know, these men and women are called to be different. So they're a good example for us because we're trying to learn how to be like these people. And I believe in a God that would take somebody from a different state and purposely place them right here in this church for our benefit. I believe that. And, and uh, I don't take that for granted. Pastors, Rusty, Mr. Ninja, these pastors, I, I don't take it for granted one, one bit, one bit. But in closing, I was asking for God just to give me something palpable to talk about for Josh and Tyler and them. They're just awesome guys. And uh, he was trying to show me a race. We're all in a race, right? And I've been part of a bunch of races. And when you're running a race, you got people that are just like, they just want to get to the finish line, right? I've been guilty of that. I've just been going through this race just wanting to get to the finish line, you know. But these people, they're the people that are in the race, and they're stopping, pulling people along with them. Like, come on. Come on, guys. Like, they're, they're, they're going to put you at a different pace because God's got, God's got a calling for all of our lives, not just the people that are fortunate enough to have a microphone or a leadership class, but even the people that just go to their mundane day-to-day -day jobs and they come here to be fed God's got a calling on your life as well so it's important that we team up team up with these pillars that God has placed in this community for our benefit and try to lean in and be open to the opportunities that God is already opened up for us so uh Let's be people that are, are in this race, and we're also the people dragging people along with this, you know? Let's do that. Good morning, and I'm gonna read, because I'm a writer, so I'm just gonna read what I wrote. <laughs> Faithful, consistent, honest, funny, focused. You should hear some of the stories, some of the jokes he tells sometimes. <laughs> focused, eager, flexible, student, teacher, patient, willing. There are just, those are just some traits that came to mind as I reflected on how the Lord wanted to honor you today. You have been transparent in sharing your experiences with God and his amazing grace and mercy in your life with us. And we are very grateful. I hope you don't mind me sharing a recent example. I remember coming in uh, for practice or rehearsal one morning and he was telling us about uh, a trip he had just taken driving all night long and so he was tired 
but he came in in the morning, early in the morning, spending some time with God and thinking about um, just his day. And he remembered a scripture that the Lord kept on his heart, and it was um, soaring on wings like eagles. He was having a hard time remembering the address, but he knew that that's what the Lord was speaking to him that morning. A few minutes later, as he was praying, he looked down at a journal that he had on his desk, and there it was, the verse. Everybody knows it. What is it? You better know it. <laughs> you better know it. It's Isaiah 40, 31. I'm going to read you from 30. It says, Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I'll never forget the look on your face. As you turn to the team, as that verse was being said when Pastor came up that morning that you had just shared with us, it was the look of those who trust in a benevolent, gracious, loving, and faithful God. It's that look that we get when he has just spoken to us so personally and is faithful to confirm that it's him that's speaking to us. Thank you for sharing that as it uh, brought such encouragement to my heart. And now how else do you honor a person? Well, you honor their family. Because we know behind every great man, there's a great woman and a great family. So Kristen, Noah, Melody, London, and Owen, thank you for building a leader for CCF. Thank you for encouraging, praying for, and supporting him as he does the same for others. Thank you for pursuing a relationship with your heavenly father, Kristen for teaching your children to do the same and being a mama bear in your generation and speaking the truth boldly. Bless you as you bless others. A few weeks ago, I was thinking about this day and I heard a message about legacy and dynasty. This gentleman described legacy as what you deposit in and what you leave for the next generation. He described dynasty as what you build with the generations. Then he talked about this connection between dynasty and the word that we hear often pastor talk about dunamis, that power, the Holy Spirit. That same morning, within about 20 minutes, I heard a song. Verse 1 was talking about leaving a worldly legacy. And the writer of the song didn't want to leave that kind of legacy. Um, he wanted to leave one that the Lord wanted him to leave. But here's verse two. It says, all the kingdoms built, all the trophies won, will crumble into dust when it's said and done. Cause all that really mattered is this. Did I live the truth to the ones I love? Was my life the proof that there is only one whose name will last forever? And here's the chorus. It does say, I don't want to leave a legacy, but remember it's talking about the legacy of the world. He says, I don't care if they remember me, And I only got one life to live, it says. I'll let every second point to him. Only Jesus. Jesus is the only name. And I got the same look that day that you did when God so sweetly speaks to us in those places. So my prayer for you, your precious family, to Kirsten, Noah, Melody, London, and Owen. Our beautiful church body also is to continue to leave a true legacy of our Christian faith. Deposit faith in the next generation. Leave this faith for them, but also build it with them. Together making a dynasty, a faith in Christ that will not only change our minds, our hearts, and our behaviors, but it will change a sin-sick culture, all for the glory of God. May I take a few more moments? This was so fun. I have to do it. <laughs> so last night we were watching the Astros game. <laughs> Go Astros, I shared with this in power class this morning. So we're watching the Astros game last night. Bottom of the eighth inning, they put in Hunter. Wait, what's his name? Hunter. Oh, now I forgot his name. Uh, thank you. They put in Hunter Brown, bottom of the eighth. Rookie, just started in September. Everybody's like, all right, Hunter. He's the rookie, right? We're up five to zero. It was awesome. But what happened? Uh-oh. Ball, ball. Ball. He's got a runner now on second. He's got a runner now on first. Some of us in the house are all, are, we're all like, switch him out, change him. No, no, we can't have this happen. But I saw Dusty Baker and I saw the older players around him and the expert in our house. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, you got to keep him in. 
they got to keep him in. And what I kept thinking about was us as believers, as a body of believers, encouraging these young leaders coming up. You can do it. Persevere. Walk in faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Refuse to be intimidated. So I encourage you with that today. Just one more character trait that I thought of. Surrendered. And it brought up Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord and not for man, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. We honor you today, Pastor Josh. Amen. How do you top that? But you know what? I was gonna tell. Um, I was gonna tell the story of the scripture as well. That that was a very powerful Sunday. I want you to take a picture of this picture. He's a very big influencer. I I go and I and I put the shirt on this morning, and Aaron's like, "You are gonna wear something under that, right?" <laughs> I said, "Yes, I will." <laughs> <laughs> but I want to start off by um, thanking and um, thanking Pastor Drake and for your yes and your obedience. What a wonderful, wonderful spot to be in to be able to sit down there and look at the generations to come. And not only that, but I don't know if um, y'all know, but his grandson and his great grandkids attend this church as well. So the legacy continues. And then we have um, Pastor Ann and Pastor, their yes and amen and obedience, not just for 10 years or 15 years, but uh, 31. And what an honor it is to be able to stand in the middle of awesome pastors like this and to see the legacy. And how many, um, how many pastors do you see that you see the the formal pastor and the the pastor now standing in the same spot and praying for the same pe- excuse me praying for the same people like we seen down here a while ago you know how awesome that is but um, let's focus on pastor <laughs> pastor Josh um, this guy this guy so um, I. After he came to Christian City, um, he seen me um, working in the foyer one Sunday, and okay, every Sunday, and he was like, "Hey, Trika, come here. Um, I need to talk to you." And so he set me down and he says, "Would you be interested in serving, you know, in this area?" And it's to assist him and help him uh, on Sundays. And I, and it, it felt like as a, you know, serving as I just got a big, huge raise. And I was like, that's a lot of responsibility. So I went home, thank goodness I didn't have to dress like him every Sunday. I went home and I talked with Aaron and we prayed about it. And what an honor it is to be able to serve with him and under him. Um, the the, he doesn't just um, tell us, uh, but he sets the example for us, just like um, Johnny was talking about pulling us along. Um, he, he sets the example for us coming in, driving all night, and then still coming in and um, serving. And there's been times where he didn't feel good and he had everybody else lead because he was hoarse and he just couldn't do it. And thank goodness, and he didn't try. And um, and then putting up with all of um, the jokes and things that I do to him, um, my favorite is to wait until he's plugging something in and just yell and, oh, <laughs> and just watch him fall to the floor. Um, but it's been a pleasure and an honor to um, be able to serve under a very godly man. And not only that, but the, um, the example he sets and how he puts his family first. 
And when you serve, it's not just you, but it's your family because the sacrifice that you're making as a family for your family to serve. They even come up here. He's used, He's been pulling uh, children, uh, his children up here with him, and they sit up here and um, practice praise and worship with him. They're sitting on his lap or crying at his feet or uh, Kirsten's chasing them <laughs> around. But you know what? He still shows up and he honors his yes and he sets an example for all of us um not saying we'll stick with this but um sets the example and and it's just been an honor it's been an honor to be able to uh, serve with you and kirsten to be in your home to see what your home life is and how he is at church is how he is at home he is no different <laughs> and neither is she and so um, we honor you today, and, and I am so glad that I was one of the ones that got to come up and honor you. Now let's have Pastor Tyler. Tyler, come on up, man. We've only got two minutes to honor you with, but come on up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and we got a couple that want to come up here, and they want to talk about you, Samantha and Abby. Where are those guys at? These guys are in our youth group. There they are, right there. Come on, stand up here, Tyler. I'm going to tell you, we got some great guys in this house. I appreciate them so very, very much. And uh, I was going to have the youth go first, but they wanted to go second. And so uh, that just puts a little more pressure on them because now it's your turn, Samantha. Well, first... I know that I'm supposed to talk for Pastor Tyler, but it's Pastor Appreciation, so I'm going to start with Pastor Clyde. I don't personally know him, but I feel like if I were to have a conversation with him, I'd be familiar with how he is, because he makes such an impact where he is, because Pastor Russ, he's always talking about him, and he's saying that he has an impact, and that's what happens when you work close with someone, they have an impact on you. So Pastor Clyde impacted Pastor Rusty, and now he impacts all of us. And his wife, Pastor Ann, she's amazing. She is truly awesome. If I'll ever have a conversation with her, you just feel intellectual and smart when you talk with her. And like, so Pastor Rusty, he influences and impacts Pastor Tyler, who then in turn touches the youth. And Pastor Pastor Tyler, um, the thing about him, he didn't have a great family at home. I'm not saying that his family didn't love him, but it was a rough house. But he doesn't let that stop him from loving us. We are part of his family now, the youth. We are here for him, and he's here for us. He's always here for us. He goes to our games. It's not just coming to us in church and saying, hey. He comes to our games. He comes to our houses if you invite him, and he's always there for you. He always has an open door for you. He always lets you come in. And if you need to schedule a meeting with him, he talks to you and he listens. He may not show it, I can tell you that, but <laughs> he really listens to you. And he takes it and he just thinks things. And he, he's a little weird, so he processes things different. But that gives you a different perspective than what you're used to. Like, so he's, he's like really close to me because we're very similar. And I know any time I can go in and I can talk to him and he'll listen to me. And he's helped me with so many problems that I've had. Because, you know, we're all a little bit problematic. And he's just always going to be there. And I know that because he's made an impact on me. And it's sure. And I know that he's not going to leave me. And that I can be rest assured that he's, he's made an impact that I hope I can impact others with. That I can take all the people... And I can put all the things that I've learned from all the pastors and apply it to someone that I can touch, someone that I can show. And I can be like, Pastor Tyler taught me this. Who taught this from Pastor Rusty? Who got it from Pastor Clyde? Because they all help us. And that's how I hope that I can be like them and that I can grow up and I can touch people how they touch people. Amen. Abby. So, first of all, I thank God because he gave, um, well, Pastor Drake, um, and from Pastor Drake came Pastor Rusty, and from Pastor Rusty, 
Pastor Tyler. <laughs> and then there was him. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so I think, I think all of you, because this is such a big family that I get to have. It's a privilege to have. And uh, if y'all didn't know me, uh, before, it's four years before he was here, I was not a quiet kid. I was the quiet kid. I was the quiet kid. I would sit in the corner and the back. I would, I would be asleep or um, just doing something. But now, four years later, I feel like, I feel like there's a different side of me that I didn't even know about. And it's, and it's the weird part. It's the weird side that I love because it's God's weird. And, uh, and I think, uh, I think them because I am who I am through God and in God through them, I became who I am. And so I think all of them and yeah. And I think the leaders, Miss Kim, she's helped a lot through with Pastor Tyler, every event they do, they, she plans it and he's the game, the, the more the game person. And so um, I think him, cause he went to master's commission, the master's commission people came here and uh, I've really loved what they have there. And, um, and that's one of the things that made him become a person he's become. And so I love them with uh, all my heart and I appreciate them. It is a privilege to have Pastor Tyler, Pastor Rusty, Pastor Clyde. It's a privilege to have all of you in, in here in this room. Thank you. I'll put your hands together. I'll stand on your feet for both of these guys, for Pastor Josh and also for Pastor Tyler. We appreciate them. Amen. They serve us well. They serve this body. They serve the community. They serve our schools. They serve our youth. They serve our children. They serve you as parents. And parents, they're some of your very best friends in this church. And so let's give a little moment to God right now. I'm going to bring a very short message to you. I'm going to talk about next man up. Next man up. How many of y'all have heard of the phrase next man up? Some of you have heard that before. It's a sporting event. It's a sporting title, a sporting role. And in sports, it refers to a true team where one player can take over for another. Now we're talking about teamwork here. It's a team and it's a, it's a joint effort. A team is either gonna success, succeed or it's gonna fail as a family, not just as a superstar. It's gonna, it's gonna pass or fail. It's gonna be a family thing. So we have to understand family and recognize. And in the, the next man up scenario, every man is important from the starting quarterback all the way to the end of the bench. And you are important to God. Relationship is important to God. And the next man up could be the guy that, that comes to Christ today. Because you never know what God's purpose and plans are. Let me pray right now. Father, I just ask, Lord, that you would give us all open eyes and open hearts to see and hear from you. Lord, as we give you this moment and this time, Lord God, you can change lives. You can change any one of us. If we're willing, if we want it, if we agree. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so I want to invite each one of you to come up. I want to invite you to come up to a new level. We're talking about these guys coming up to new levels. Why not we all come up? We level up, the next man up, that every one of us, we, in our heart, we leave today thinking, I'm going to step up to a new level, to a new place. Now, like I said, I've been in 40 years of ministry. This year was my 40th year. I've seen a lot. Man, I could tell you stories forever and ever. Good stories and bad stories because it all happens everywhere where you are. But it's the condition of your heart and how you cipher these things, how you receive these things. Because a few weeks ago, I preached on celebrating struggle. The only way you get stronger is through struggle. And God's got struggles in your life to make you strong. I don't pray make it easy, make me strong. Amen? And so we all have stories, every one of us, but there's a story that has to be told. And so we as fathers, we invite our sons into the community of being men. That's a father's role. As a pastor, I'm inviting you, I'm inviting these guys up to be spiritual sons, to be spiritual daughters, to be a part of the community and the community of God. And you know, I have two sons of my own, grandsons. 
My son Chad was the last griffin. Now, thank goodness, there's two boys that can carry on that name. But how many of you know that the strength of a name is not in silver and gold? It's in wisdom and the riches of wisdom. It's the riches of choices that we make. And so I'm inviting Tyler and Josh to level up, to be the next man up. I'm inviting them. I'm inviting you. I'm inviting them to be an example by the life that they live. I'm inviting them to be an example by the families that they have, the families they produce. I'm inviting them to be an example with the finances that they have and how they use their finances. I'm inviting them in every way because as a pastor, if we're not transparent, we can't be anything. We have to be transparent. We have to live our lives transparently. You know, if, if somebody sees me doing something, it'll, it'll be out there. Because people are always watching. You know what the good news is? Is that people are always watching. That's not the bad news. That's the good news. Amen? While some people see it as bad, I want to live a life that others want to follow. Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. He didn't say, follow me. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus met his disciples and said, follow me and I will make you. God can't make you anything if you're not following. But when we follow and when we find the people to follow, what happens is our capacity goes up. I thank God for many men in my life and women in my life that got me to new levels because I never would have found a new level on my own. I wouldn't have found a new level by myself. I wouldn't have gotten to that next place or that next stop if I wasn't willing to be the next man, the next man up. And so connection, you were made for relationships. You were made for connections. You were made that way. I just finished my brain study. Your brain is made for connection. An unconnected brain withers and dies. An unconnected heart withers and dies. We were made for connection. If you want to see where your future is, find your four best friends. That's the direction you're going. Sometimes it's easier to see it in others than to see it in ourselves. I was reading yesterday, sometimes the hardest thing to see is the thing that is right in front of you. It's amazing. But we have to make an attempt and we have to draw on the right people. And so you were made for connection. We all need people. Every one of us need people. You need people. I need people. We all need people. I'm, I'm reminded, I like to tell the story of Paul, or he was rather Saul. And Saul was killing Christians. And one day on the Damascus Road, he saw a light and Jesus spoke to him and said, Why are you kicking against the pricks? Son, you can't win. I'm Jesus, man, you can't win. And he gave his heart, he gave his life, he was blinded. Another man prayed for him, his eyes were opened. He went and he studied for a couple of years to hear from the voice of God and to learn God. And then he ran into a man, a man that was instrumental in his life. How many of you realize that we all need instrumental people in our life? He ran into a guy named Barnabas. Now, he and Barnabas traveled together and ministered together. But do you know what Barnabas did for Paul that nobody else did? Barnabas opened doors for Paul. Barnabas went and told the other apostles, the other disciples. He said, you know, you guys, you need to listen to this man. You need to hear his testimony. You need to hear his testimony. We're not going to listen to him. Man, he was killing Christians. He was killing us. As a matter of fact, Stephen died at the hands of Paul. He held the robes while they stoned him. Their personal friends in ministry died at the hands of this man. And Barnabas said, he has changed. He's given his heart to the Lord. Barnabas opened doors that no other man could open. And then he met a man along the way who journeyed with him, who fought with him, who would, would, would fight a lion. And his name was Silas. And you know what Silas did? Silas went to prison with Paul. How many of you have friends, such good friends, they'll go to prison with you? Not that many, huh? <laughs> I didn't see a lot of hands go up. How many of you realize you need people that don't leave you in the midst of your battle? How many of you know you need people that will go to prison with you? Amen. And that's what Silas did. That's the kind of friend Silas was. That's who Silas was to Paul. Silas was an encourager because things aren't always easy. We all need to find a Silas in our life. And Paul had another special man in his life and his name was Timothy. And Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy. He had other spiritual sons as well. But I'm just going to talk about Timothy right now. Spiritually, who are those people in your life? Spiritually. 
You see, God didn't make us to be an island. He didn't make me to be an island. He didn't make you to be an island. I love it when I see Josh off ministering and doing stuff with, with these people. And I see Tyler off ministering and doing stuff with these people. Why? Because we're all on the same team. It's the next man up. We're not doing it for ourselves, but we're doing it for God. And we're recognizing that Jesus has a way of sending people out. But Jesus never, ever sent anybody out alone. He always sent them at the least. He sent them in twos. And so Jesus sent his disciples out in twos. In Genesis chapter 1, God says it's not good for man to be alone. You don't need to be alone. The devil wants to capture you alone. As a matter of fact, the devil will divide and conquer. He'll try to separate you, alienate you, and then kill you. He'll take the life out of you. God always said it's better to have two. Why? Because one can put 1,000 to flight. Two can put 10,000 to flight. What we are exponentially is so much greater when we're together than when we're apart. Moses had a Joshua. And God was, you know, all over Moses. But then he said, Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Elijah produced a guy named Elisha. He's walking along. God said, that's the man. He walked over there, hit him with his coat. He said, hey, man, what are you? He said, man, I got nothing to do with you. I'm out of here. And he said, well, give me time. He recognized who he was and he recognized the call. How many of you realize the call on you to follow is on you and not the person you're following? Their, their call is to make themselves available. You know, it's just like in counseling. If I've got people I'm counseling, I've got to keep calling them to remind them to come to their appointment. I'm not calling them. Why? Because it won't work. Follow. That's one of the greatest keys to Scripture. You know why? Because whatever you follow is what you become. Just look at your friends. It's so important. Elisha, by the way, produced twice the miracles that Elijah produced. Why? Because he got a double anointing. You know, in the Old Testament, they would anoint the high priest and they would pour the oil. But what's unique is the high priest took the old clothes of the former priest that had already been anointed. And that anointing continued. And it was anointing after anointing after anointing. And, of course, Paul had Timothy, who Timothy became the pastor of Ephesus, which was the most influential and the largest church of its time. You see, Paul had this habit, had this problem. Wherever he went and he preached the gospel, guess what happened? Two things happened, revival and riot. Revival and riot. Revival, people getting saved, riot. They're trying to kill them, trying to get them out of town. And Paul had this habit. But when he came to Ephesus, he said, you know what? This time in Ephesus, he said, I'm not running. He said, this time the devil's running. And he literally ran the devil out of Ephesus. And Timothy became the pastor there. It's important to understand and to recognize that, that we're coming up to something bigger than us. That it's not just about me, it's bigger than me. What you're doing is not about you, but it's about generations. It's about the legacy that is coming after you. And Jesus, he had his inner circle of three. Then he had the 12 disciples. Then he had the 70. Then he had the 120 who met in the upper room. The 500 that started there. And from that, the masses and the Bible said he loved the world. But he died alone. Let me put it to you like this. Someone is not going to hell. Someone is going to heaven because of you. You say, well, why do you say it that way? Because you're all going to hell without Jesus. Me too. So we're all bound to hell. I mean, that's not, you know, I mean, that's just the way it is. Except for a person. Except for a man. Except for a woman. Even maybe a child, except for somebody. The only way we're going to get to heaven is through somebody. And so God so loved the world that he made his son a man. A man, fully man, fully incarnate. Uh, the word Christian means little Christ-like creatures. And we become like our Father. Amen, you guys have heard me say this before, that you should look like your Father and not the milkman. Right? Be something wrong with that. Well, I'm still changing into his image. And there are some scriptures that I want to close with that, that maybe you ought to think of. In 1 Timothy 5, 17, it says, Let the elders that rule well, rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Yes. 
especially they that labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, and their labor is worthy of his reward. Now the, the word honor is timis in the Greek, and it means to receive a payment or compensation. The word labor is the most important thing we can do. But the Bible says, let us labor in the gospel. For that reason, in Acts chapter 6, deacons were appointed to take care of the business, the, the, the task that was physical, that was menial, that wasn't the preaching of the word. Why? Because we're all one team. Who labor in the word and doctrine. 1 Corinthians 9, 14. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. That's 1 Corinthians 9, 14. Acts 17, 11 says, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. So what was Thessalonica? Thessalonica, we have a book called 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. It was one of the best churches Paul ever planted. He was only there for three weeks. Why was he there for only three weeks? Because they tried to kill him and they ran him out of town. They went beating on the house and the doors where he was staying. He, he ran out. Remember, Paul had this, this problem. Everywhere he went, riot followed him and revival followed him. And this is what they said. This is the man that's turning the world upside down. But now when he came the next place after Thessalonica, he said this. He said, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And so how many of you realize that's the church we want to be? I mean, that's, that's, that's who we want to be like. Because coming into Thessalonica, they said, we can't let these men in our city because they're turning the world upside down do you realize you're living in an upside down world sin has already made this world upside down but when you change your body when you change your tilt it seems strange to be right side up but that's what God does in us and through us so you can learn something, you can garner something. Here's a, a scripture that most people don't even realize is in the Bible. Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them for their keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that wouldn't be an advantage for you. I bet you guys never thought about that. So Pastor Rusty, one day you're going to stand before God and you're going to give an account of me? That's what you just read. And said, don't, don't. You know you can't lie in heaven. <laughs> We're all one team. We're all one body. We all need each other. And, and what these guys do is not easy. I'm going to tell you, I can't be with a bunch of teenagers for 48 hours. They wear me out. They flat wear me out. They don't sleep. I used to could, couldn't I, Ann? I used to could. I used to was the one that kept them awake. <laughs> How many of you know those days change as we all change into new fields, into new areas? I'm going to close with this scripture. 1 Peter 5, verse 1 through 3. So I exhort the elders that are among you as fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And that's what these guys have been. Examples to the flock. Would y'all come up here, both of you? Kirsten, come on up here too. I want you guys to stretch your hands out towards them. They're going to come stand on both sides of me. I want to pray over them. I know that you have, some of you have cards, some of you have gifts. Big T's got car washes, man, for you guys. He's got certificates to get you a car wash. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. you got a work to do. Big T, this is a single guy. His probably needs washed more. They got a bunch of kids. The inside of their van will be a mess. Be ready. So he wants the outside to look good because he's single. He wants the inside to look good because he's a family man. 
I trust and I know you do an excellent job at that. But give these guys cards. Give them gifts. Do things for them. Bless them. There's not any greater way to show the people that you love them than by the things that you do and the things that you give. For God so loved the world that what did he do? He gave. Stretch your hands out. Pastor Ann, come on up here and why don't you lay hands on these guys? I'm going to pray over them. How many of y'all thank God for Pastor Ann? She is absolutely amazing and incredible. I'm so glad she came back from Lake Tahoe. She and my daughter went on a little girl trip. They try to do that every year and then COVID kind of messed that up. And now that Hillary's pregnant, this may be her last girl trip for a while. <laughs> Y'all are planning a cruise. What are you going to do with the baby? Travis, you and me, we need to have a long talk. Father, I pray for these great guys, these men and women of God. I pray, Father God, that you would be with them, Lord. I pray for Pastor Tyler that you would continue to bless the youth through him through his ministry, Lord. I thank you, Father, for that which you've already begun, Lord. I, I thank you, Father, for the four years that he's already put in at Christian City Fellowship, Lord, that those four years have been great, Lord. I thank you, Father, for Pastor Josh and Kirsten, Lord. I thank you for blessing them, Lord. We hunted and we looked for a long time, but we waited patiently for the right person, not just any person, but the right person, Lord. We believe you sent your right person, Lord. And so we speak blessing over them, over their children, Lord, over their whole family, Lord. We speak blessing and increase, Lord. And we thank you, Father, for the gift. We thank you for the giver. We thank you for the season of honor and honoring these guys, Lord God. I thank you, Father, that you've given me 40 years of ministry and 31 years here at Christian City Fellowship. And I know, Lord, the very best is ahead of us, Lord. The best days, Lord God. We haven't even tasted them yet, Lord. But we're coming into a season, Lord, an important season. A season of transformation. A season, Lord, where lives are changed. And so bless us in this new season. Bless us in this frontier, Lord, as we go into hell and we bring people out for heaven, Lord. We thank you for the power. We thank you for the will. And we thank you for your ability and your dunamis that works mightily in us, Lord. Because what is working mightily in us is the same thing that's going to work through us, Lord. And it's going to touch the hurting. It's going to touch the loss. It's going to touch the broken, Lord. And we thank you, Father, for rewarding. We thank you, Lord, for blessing. We thank you for healing. And most of all, we thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.